so. Okay, so we're in our uh, penultimate uh, class here for uh, for Buildroot at, at e A L E or E A L. Um, we've got uh, Thomas Pedazzoni. Uh, we, we've been calling him Mr. Buildroot uh, all week, so uh, giving the talk. So um, lots of uh, lots of great information. Certainly, uh, if you've got questions on Buildroot, he's one one of the, the main people to ask questions about. Um, and uh, yeah, after after this, we are going to be giving away uh, our uh, prize, and then we are going to. Uh, do our last talk of the day, uh, which is our final talk on uh, a somewhat more advanced side of, of Yocto project. But uh, for now, Thomas, take it away. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Thomas. I'll be uh, talking and then hopefully helping you getting started with uh, Build Roots. But before starting, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Ben for organizing the uh, EL track and all the, uh, the other folks that have been involved in preparing the hardware and everything. I think it's a really great idea. So I'm glad to be here today to. Uh, uh, share what I know about uh, Buildroot and hopefully get more uh, users and uh, uh, and the future contributors to that uh, that project. So I work for a company called Brutalin. We used to be uh, called Free Electrons, but we had to change our name about a month ago because of a trademark dispute. We were no longer allowed to use the name Free. Um, so our new name is Bootlane, but other than that, it's still the same company, same people, same principle. So we are an embedded Linux consulting shop. Uh, we do uh, engineering services, but also training services. So we've got a bunch of uh, training courses on Embedded Linux, on Buildroot, on uh, Yocto, and a bunch of other things. And I think what uh, makes us a little bit unique in that area is that our training materials are all freely available. So you can go on our website, and all our slides and, and uh, lab instructions, everything is fully open. So you can get access to that freely without paying anything. Um, so besides working at, at Bootlane, where we do use Buildroot for a number of projects, we also do use Yocto for a number of projects, so we have nothing against Yocto. Um, I am a uh, contributor to uh, this Buildroot project in my spare time, and I come from France, but I guess you've already noticed that from my terrible English accent. Um, so, um, oh, that's a terrible uh, slide viewer thing that I have here. Um, let me fire up something else. Um, that hopefully will be a bit nicer um, because, yeah, something like that will be better. So when you, you want to build a, an embedded Linux system, you've got a couple of um, um, solutions available. Uh, one of them is to use a pre-built binary distribution like uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, and there's plenty of others, um, uh, ARMBN, Raspbian, or all those derivatives. Um, the big benefit of those solutions is that it's readily available. Everything is already compiled. Uh, it uses familiar uh, package management systems. You can very easily install new stuff, update packages, and it's, it's a familiar environment. So that's the, the big uh, benefits, obviously. So to get started, it looks like a good solution. But it has a, a number of downsides, obviously. It's uh, pretty large. I mean, even a, a basic installation of Debian, which is uh, supposed to be fairly small, is still a uh, 100 or more megabytes in, in size, so it's not, not that small. Uh, it's definitely not available for all CPU architectures. So if you're doing x86 on or ARM, it's fine. I mean, Fedora and Ubuntu and Debian are all available on those uh, mainstream architectures. But if you're doing something more specialized, like uh, an ARM no MMU or uh, some uh, weird variant of a MIPS uh, SOC that may not be supported by those big distributions. They are not necessarily easy to customize. Yes, you can install remove packages, but what if you need that package with a slightly different configuration? Is there a stripped down to save space or uh, stripped up with more uh, features that were not included in the Debian or Ubuntu package? You can recompile the package, but if you have to do that for several packages, it starts to be a bit cumbersome. So not really great. And they generally don't really um, support cross compilation. So you do native build, which means you build your software on the target. If your target is a fast system with lots of RAM and storage, that may be acceptable. But in a number of embedded situations, that's not the case. And therefore, having to build natively on the target may be really annoying. Uh, so to get started on your Raspberry Pi or um, um, favorite development board, yes, using a binary distro might be uh, like really easy to uh, get started quickly. But to make a real product, it may not be uh, such a great solution. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the other solution that you have is that you can uh, build everything manually. I mean, you've got to build BuzzyBox and your kernel and U-Boot and, and, and this library and this other library and this other application. You can build all of that stuff manually. 
Um, so that gives you a lot of flexibility. You do everything by hand, so you can fine tune every com configuration flag, every compilation flag that you want. Uh, you can select whichever version of uh, every component you need. Uh, so you can make the system as small, as stripped down, as specialized as you want. Um, but that's pretty complicated. I mean, how do you, uh, how are you going to handle all the cross compilation issues, all the dependencies that this library depends on this other library, but at least version this or that? but that is going to be incompatible with this other library here. Um, that's kind of a mess to handle manually. Uh, it makes the, the process of building the system not necessarily reproducible. Um, are you going to remember all the steps you've gone through to build your system? You can certainly write a shell script that does that for you, but it's well, not very nice to do. Um, and mainly you don't benefit from any other people work. I mean, um, you have to, uh, figure out how to build BusyBox and how to build, uh, I don't know, Qt or GTK or x.org or Wayland or whatever you need on your embedded system and, and redo what a lot of other people have done. So in, in between, um, you've got the, uh, the solution that is um, um, well implemented by projects like uh, Open Embedded, Yocto, uh, BuildRoot, OpenWRT, PTXDist, and there's a bunch of other uh, build systems around. Um, where the idea is to kind of try to get the, the best of both worlds in, in some sense. Um, it's to be able to build systems that are um, small and where you have um, a lot of flexibility on, 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 uh, on what you include in your system, the version of the components, their configuration. Um, and this is made possible because you build things from source, because you're building from source, contrary to a binary distribution, you've got lots and lots of flexibility. Um, because you have a tool that handles the build, it becomes reproducible. So based on uh, the definition of a system, you can rebuild that system now in six months and in five years and get the same state of the system. You can pass your configuration to other colleagues that will be sure to build the same system. So all can, everyone can work on the same uh, basis, which is good for uh, collaborating between colleagues on the same project or maintaining it over the, the long run. Um, it makes it uh, available for virtually all architecture. I mean, as, as soon as you've got a GCC, Binitil, C library, kernel port for a new CPU architecture, since everything is built from source, then suddenly uh, pretty much every library around uh, becomes available, unless it has uh, CPU specific details, but most of them do not. Um, so that, may, that means that you can build for uh, exotic uh, architectures or brand new CPUs uh, fairly easily. Um, Downside is uh, one more tool to learn in your toolbox. Uh, it's not as if uh, go, uh, learning embedded Linux uh, was a, a learning free experience. So that's one more thing you've got to, to learn. Uh, some of those tools are um, somewhat uh, simpler than others, uh, to say the least. Uh, and Buildwood is known to be uh, some of the, uh, uh, the simplest solution that, that are available. And obviously the build time compared to uh, just uh, dropping an, a Raspbian or Ambian on your SD card where uh, well, everything is already pre-built. Uh, here, uh, your CPU is uh, going to be uh, heavily used for uh, building stuff, and that consumes uh, some time. So, PureRoot falls into that um, category. Um, it's an embedded Linux build system, so the idea is uh, uh, nothing really crazy or uh, rocket science. It's just a, a bunch of scripts, make files, uh, whatever uh, that is, that will, um, as input, take uh, the source code for open source components or in house proprietary components coming from HTTP, FTP servers, Git, Subversion, whatever version control system you like. So that's taking the source code on one side, uh, it's taking the configuration on the other side that says, I want to build a system for ARM with the kernel version that um, 4.14 with this configuration, with BuzzyBox, with Qt, with this, with that. And it's gonna process all of that things, um, making sure that it downloads, extracts, configures, builds, and installs all those components in the right order to finally produce what you're in the end interested in, a uh, root file system image, a kernel image, a uh, cross compilation tool chain, and potentially bootloader images as well. So everything you need to just uh, get your uh, embedded Linux system up and running. Um, so because you're building from source, you've got lots of flexibility. You can adjust uh, the version of the BuzzyBox you want or the version of Qt, adjust the config options, uh, and, and really customize your, your system um, uh, in a very fine-grained way. Um, because you're cross-compiling, you can leverage the, the build speed of fast build machines. You can take your very uh, fast x86-64 um, machine that has uh, gigabytes of RAM and very fast SSD storage 
and you do build, you build there and only have on the target what you need to um, 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 to well, run your uh, final application. And actually, uh, Build Boot pushes that principle pretty far in the sense that it doesn't even support building on the target. So Build Boot doesn't support uh, installing GCC on your target. Everything has to be done by cross-compilation. Uh, by contrast, Yocto supports installing GCC and a tool chain on the target so you can build things on the target. Build Boot does not support that use case. We assume that everybody cross-compiles on his machine and the target is only there to run programs, not to build programs. Um, it provides uh, recipes, uh, so it's kind of the term that I'm borrowing from the uh, open embedded world here. We don't call it call them recipes in, in BuildWood, but it's the principle is the same. It's basically some description on how to build a specific software component. And that makes uh, the whole work a lot easier because you don't need to learn, again, how to build Qt or x.org or Wayland. It's already included. Uh, it, you may need to extend it for your own components, but at least for a, a, a wide range of um, very uh, widely used open source components, some recipes are already available. Um, so what is built with in, in a, a kind of a single slide summary? Um, embedded Linux build system, that's what I, what I was describing. Um, fast and uh, simple root file system in minutes. So we are, you'll see in the, in the next lab that uh, within uh, I think I timed the, the, the first build for the next lab to be uh, um, about four, 15 minutes. And it's actually pretty long because the um, a Linux kernel configuration that exists by default for the, the pocket beagle is uh, very uh, heavy and has lots and lots of options enabled, like display support, which we're not going to use, and many other things. We could probably uh, strip down the, the, the build time to uh, less than five minutes um, if with a little bit of effort, but it's going to be about 15 minutes to get a uh, uh, a Linux system up and running. And the system is pretty small. Um, in your case, it's going to be about, I'd say, 15 megabytes or 18 megabytes, something like that, out of which 12 to 15 megabytes are kernel modules, again, because the kernel configuration is really, really uh, fat for uh, uh, what the Pocket Beagle is, really. Um, so that could be also improved a little bit. Um, another aspect of BuildRoot is that it's um, known to be fairly easy to use and understand. So we have uh, uh, we are using existing technologies, uh, kconfig, so we are using the same uh, configuration system as the Linux kernel. You, you've got a familiar mini config, xconfig, and, and so on, family of um, interfaces to configure your system. Um, and in terms of uh, writing the recipes, we simply use make files. So it's not like a special customized language that you're using, but plain old make. Um, which has its own quirks and, and weird things, but it's, it's a standard technology that if you learn it, it's going to be useful for other projects as well. Um, I already talked about the size of the file system. Uh, so we've got uh, 2,300 packages uh, readily available in BuildRoot. So as I mentioned, the big, the big things, um, but also lots and lots of small libraries and tools here and there that uh, uh, cover most of the, uh, the open source components that are typically useful in embedded systems. And you can extend that, and I'll cover that in the next some of the next slides. Um, a big characteristic of um, BuildRoot is that it generates file system images and not the distribution. So I'm, I think some of you probably participated to the um, uh, the this uh, Yocto lab uh, earlier uh, today. Um, Yocto Open Embedded generates a Linux distribution with the concept of packages. You can have a package manager on the target to uh, at runtime install, remove, update uh, individual packages. BuildRoot has none of that. It produces a file system image, like an ext4 or squashfs file system image, and that's kind of fixed. If you want to update the system, you can. You have to do a full system update, right? So it's more. Some people say it's more a firmware generator than a, a Linux distribution generator, right? Um, and that's that's very intentional in our model. We think that uh, upgrading uh, the complete system is the um, the sane and safe way to do an upgrade to be sure that what you've tested in your lab is what you're actually deploying in the field uh, and not have like surprises with partial updates of packages and stuff like that. Uh, people may or may not agree, but that's kind of the one of the design principles that we have in BuildRoot. Um, it's a uh, vendor neutral um, project, so contrary to uh, um, uh, the Octo project that is uh, very uh, driven by one single company. Um, and it's kind of very uh, heavily corporate oriented. Uh, uh, BuildRoot really takes its roots more from the open source community. So it's been started by um, 
um, I would say, random developers on the internet and has grown up uh, um, uh, since uh, 2001 as the project it is today. So lots and lots of companies are using BuildRoot. Google is using BuildRoot. Rockwell Collins is using BuildRoot. Um, I just learned this week Tesla is using BuildRoot. GoPro is using BuildRoot. So lots and lots of big companies are using it. Uh, some of them are even contributing to it. We've got contributions from IBM, from Imagination Technologies, and from a, a lot of other silicon vendors. Um, but it's, it's just an open source project open to anyone. And it, it doesn't have any like steering committee where people have to pay to enter the foundation or something like that. It's just a regular open source project. Um, the community is pretty active. We do uh, stable releases every three months. Uh, so we have got this very fixed um, um, release schedule. Uh, February and May, August and October, and that's um, really, uh, um, well, let's say November, not October, um, that our fixed uh, release cadence. Um, yeah, that's about it. So uh, how do you get started with BuildRoot? You clone the um, source code. It's pretty small because it only contains uh, recipes, so a bunch of make files uh, and the documentation that goes with it. So I'm not sure exactly what the size of the, the Git repo is, but the, the overall source code is pretty small. Um, you get into it, and you fire up make mini config. And that's where you can configure your whole system. So compared to um, OE, Yocto, where the definition of your system is more spread into different text files that you have to figure out what they are uh, each useful for, here the configuration is really um, centralized in one place, uh, in that you can uh, modify using menu config or x config if that, your pre if that is your preference. So I'm going to give you a quick walk through the, um, the available options so you get a feeling of on what you can uh, configure. Uh, it's definitely not going to be an um, extensive description of all the options that would be very boring, uh, and some of them are pretty advanced. Uh, but it, it kind of uh, hopefully will give you a feeling of, of what you can do there. So the obvious first kind of um, and, and the the, uh, the the options are kind of laid out in what we think is a fairly logical way. Uh, so the first thing you want to uh, define is what is your target architecture, kind of the, the main um, definition of what your embedded system is. So that's where you define, I'm using an ARM Cortex-A8, and I want to build with, um, I don't know, software, software floating point, hardware floating point, and that kind of uh, very hardware and, and architecture-specific definitions. So that's the list of CPU architectures we support. And it's uh, fairly easy to extend it to other uh, CPU architectures if needed, as long as there's proper GCC and Vinitials and GLOPC support. Um, so that's the first step. And then we've got a number of uh, build options. It's more how your build is going to take place. So that's where you can customize things like, hey, um, all the tarballs that you will download, instead of putting them into this default folder, you can put them here so that you can perhaps share it with other projects that um, uh, also require downloading a lot of stuff from the, uh, from the internet. Uh, that's where you can define how many parallel jobs will um, uh, be used by BuildRoot to build your system. Uh, so that um, is a good uh, opportunity to describe um, a specific kind of aspect or limitation of BuildRoot. Right now, BuildRoot builds every package sequentially um, compared to other packages. So when we're building BuzzyBox, we're only building BuzzyBox and nothing else at the same time. But we're for to build BuzzyBox itself, we're using make minus j something to use multiple cores. And that's what is, is being defined here, is how many cores you want to use. So it has the same defaults that's guessed against the, the number of CPUs in your machine. Um, but we're not doing top level parallel builds. So doing make minus j four uh, to start the build of build root doesn't make sense because we anyway disable top level parallel build. That's being worked on. I mentioned that in my talk on, on, on Monday. I'm working on this topic at the moment, but it's, it's not in mainline at the moment. Um, you can use Ccache if you want to speed up a little bit the builds. You can set if you want to use uh, fully uh, static libraries or only shared libraries or both. So there's a bunch of other options in here. Um, in terms of tool chains, uh, we support two uh, different solutions. You can ask BuildRoot to build its own. Um, so it's going to build GCC and GLOPC and Binitils in the right order to make things work and provide you a cross-compilation tool chain. Or BuildRoot can uh, use an existing uh, tool chain, uh, which is going to save quite a lot of build time and, and also allows you to reuse uh, perhaps a tool chain provided by your vendor that you trust more than, than the one that, that BuildRoot could, uh, could build. So the two options are really supported um, on, uh, on an equal foot and um, 
it's really up to uh, your project to decide what, what uh, fit your needs uh, best. Um, then you can, you have a bunch of, I would say, um, system level uh, options that define well, the uh, high level configuration of the system that will be generated for the target. Um, to define things like which init system do you want to use? Do you want to do systemd or uh, uh, use a more uh, traditional buzzy box init or sysb init or something like that? How do you want slash dev to be managed? Do you want to use udev or mdev or uh, something else? Uh, what is the host name, the root password, um, and other things? And then there are uh, different uh, mechanisms here to customize the, um, the root file system, uh, things like overlays, post-build script, post-image script, and I'm going to talk more about these uh, in a moment because this is a, a quite important topic. We can configure the kernel you want to, uh, to build. So this is where you can, you can say, OK, I want to use the official kernel from kernel.org version 4.15 and with spe this specific configuration. Or I want to use that kernel from this Git repository with this tag. And I want to apply those patches in addition to it. So it's pretty flexible in what you can, you, you can, uh, how you can grab the kernel and how you can configure it. The configuration can be a file or a dev config plus fragments. There's lots of different ways you can configure your kernel here. Um, um, and um, because that's obviously a component that's so hardware specific that most people use some kind of custom kernel uh, at some point. We support a number of real-time extensions or other kernel extensions, but mainly real-time, things like RTAI or Xenomai uh, that was uh, mentioned in talk uh, earlier this week as well. Um, so a pretty flexible way of, of uh, building uh, your kernel. And then uh, this uh, six-step target packages. This is where we've got all your, our, your user space programs and libraries that you might need on your target. So this is the, the bulk of uh, what Bitroot is, uh, building libraries and programs for your target. So this is where you can find things like Qt and x.or and gtk and, and uh, uh, interpreted languages, Python, Perl, and Ruby, and a bunch of others, and then networking things, crypto, graphics, you name it. That's really a lot of packages, and we're adding more and more and more of these packages as we go. Um, I, I think uh, it's pretty much um, almost every day a new package is being submitted on the, on the build mailing list by, by contributors. So it's, it's a growing list of packages, and, and you can definitely uh, contribute to that list by adding uh, uh, your own packages. Um, once you've defined um, the set of packages that you want, uh, then you have to define what sort of output you want. Do you want an XP4 file system image? Do you want a SquashFS image or uh, some other file system format? That's uh, where you can define that. And there's a bunch of uh, sub options here to tweak uh, the specific file system images, but that's the overall idea. Then you can define the bootloader you want to use. So it's maybe not very logical to have the bootloaders at the end because you typically start by booting your platform before starting the kernel. But anyway, that's uh, how it's organized in many config. So you can ask to build like Grub2 or uBoot or Bearbox. And here, uh, very much like the kernel, where we offer a lot of flexibility on selecting the version and the configuration, we have the same flexibility for bootloaders because they are also very hardware specific. Um, and finally, you've got a, an option for building host utilities. So uh, Buildroot and, and, and Yocto and all those build systems are mainly meant to cross-compile stuff. Uh, so that's where you define what is going to, have, uh, to go on the target. But to be able to cross-compile, you also very often need to build a bunch of programs on the host um, that are necessary to build things for the target. And most of the host programs are going to be automatically built as dependencies of the target packages. So if to build the library foobar on the target, you need that specific program on the host, Buildroot's going to take care of that uh, automatically. But if there's some specific program that you use to debug your target remotely, uh, let's say OpenOCD, for example, that you want on your host machine, then you can enable it there. So you can build, I don't know, OpenOCD or maybe QMU or a bunch of other programs that uh, even though they are not cross-compiled, they may be useful as part of your embedded um, um, well, work and, and debugging or flashing activities. Um, so once you've defined the, the configuration, um, it's time to start the build. Um, you run make. Uh, it's, after all, just a bunch of make files. So you run make, and it's going to do its work. Depending on um, how big your configuration is, it might take from a few minutes to uh, 
half an hour or an hour or more uh, if your system is really, really large. And then you get the output in uh, a bunch of folders in the uh, by default output. So you've got output images for the uh, um, really the final results that are uh, uh, useful to you. Um, so that's where you are going to find the kernel images, the device tree blobs, the bootloader images, the root file system image, and any other like final image that Bluetooth has produced. And that's pretty much ready to be flashed on your embedded system. So really, um, getting started with build root is make menu config, uh, click, 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 click the options that you want, make, wait, and profit. That's pretty much it. Um, I forgot to say one thing before starting my long speech is that if you have any question, please interrupt me at any time. Um, that's um, not a regular talk, that's more a, a tutorial. So um, yeah, if you have any question about what I've covered so far, um, please, um, yeah. So U-Boot is new to me, and I used to grub on my laptop and desktop. So what's the advantage of U-Boot over grub? Ah, well, that's a good question. It's kind of uh, uh, not directly related, but I, I tried to make an answer. I think the advantage is that it, it works on a lot more architectures. I mean, grub is historically very x86 oriented. It has grown ARM support in, in recent years. Um, but, but I mean, other than ARM, that, that's it. And uh, uh, U-Boot grew up from more of the PowerPC uh, world and then was extended to, to support ARM and MIPS and, and, I don't know, Blackfin and ARC. And it pretty much supports all the, uh, the almost all the CPU architectures that, that the kernel supports. And, um, and so it's, it's very more widespread in, in some sense than, than, than Grub is. I mean, to me, Grub is weird. I, have, I don't know how Grub works. I don't, even though it's there on my laptop, obviously, uh, U-Boot as an embedded Linux developer is much more familiar to me than Grub. So it's kind of, I guess, a, a, a difference of perspective, but as an embedded Linux person, U-Boot is a normal thing to me, and Grub is this weird stuff that I've never really understood. Um, I guess it's different for, uh, for people having more uh, a desktop or server um, uh, background. But yeah, U-Boot is kind of uh, the de facto standard for uh, booting on, on embedded devices. Yep. Is there a way to add like a board support package through build root? Yeah, um, okay, is there a way to add a board support package? We don't really have a, a notion of a board support package per se because board support package is a very vague term that doesn't mean much in the end. What, what is a board support package? It's basically having a bootloader that works, having a kernel that works, and let's say having a tool chain that matches your platform, right? That's pretty much what it is. Hmm? Drivers, um, I said kernel, right? So the drivers are in the kernel. So if you have a bootloader and a kernel that works, um, then you've got your BSP, right? You don't need anything more than that, um, except sometimes a few user space libraries for like GPU support or uh, uh, video codecs and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's just having the right bootloader and the right kernel version and configuration. So all what you need to do is go to this menu config and tell build root, okay, for my board, uh, the right kernel version is that one with those patches that I've got from the vendor or that I've got from some other place. And this is the kernel configuration that I want. So it's pretty easy if you've got a BSP from any vendor, uh, be it a Yocto-based BSP or a PTX-based BSP or random stuff um, uh, provided on... Uh, on, uh, on the web server by a vendor and turn it into something you can use into, in, in build root. And it's really just a matter of pointing uh, build root to the right place. I, um, I wonder whether the, the question was about whether or not you can port U-Boot to a new board. Oh, was that? No, I think it was really like, how do you get was a BSP it? in? in oh, okay. How would you put custom drivers, for example, into build root? You don't put custom drivers in build root. A custom driver goes in the kernel. Or if, if it's really custom, something that won't go upstream, that won't be in, 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 the, in the mainline kernel. So you've got, I would say for that, you've got two choices. Either um, your, uh, your drivers are maintained um, in, in, with your kernel tree. So you've got a branch of the Linux kernel where you do all your kernel customization. And then you can tell root 
go grab this kernel from my local Git repository at that tag or that version that you want, and you can do whatever customization you want. And I typically do that in a large number of projects. Um, or you may decide to keep your drivers standalone, uh, built as out of three modules. And in that case, you can create build packages, and we've got a number of these, uh, that will specifically build your out of three modules. Right? Uh, more questions? No? Okay. Um, so the build output, um, I already mentioned output slash images, but I think it's worth um, talking more about what you have, you have here. It goes by default in the um, output folder, but that can be customized using the O equal option that uh, allows to do what we call out of tree build. So if you want to build several build root configurations from the same build root source tree, very much like uh, it is possible to do uh, when you build a Linux kernel or U-boot or a number of other projects. But by default, it goes in output. Um, so what you've got is the final images that I've mentioned already. Um, in output build, this is where we extract everything you need to build. So we download the kernel source code, we extract the tarball or uh, clone the git repository in output build slash Linux. If you build BuzzyBox, you've got output build BuzzyBox. That's where we extract the source code, that's where we do the build for BuzzyBox. Uh, in output host, this is where we install um, everything that's built for the host, so the cross compiler, but any other program that, as I mentioned before, is needed to uh, be able to cross compile other uh, libraries and, and programs that you have selected in your configuration. Within output host, we've got a subdirectory called the sysroot, which contains all the headers and libraries cross compiled for the, for the target. So this is what the cross compiler will use when you will build an application that needs libraries that have been cross compiled for the target. We've got output target, which is where uh, the target root file system is being prepared. So in output target, you have something that looks like a Linux root file system with the typical bin and sbin, dev, proc, and then and etc folders. And this is where, uh, as package, uh, packages are being built, build root installs everything that uh, packages are contributing. So that's, this is where the BuzzyBox package will install the BuzzyBox binary, where the Qt package will install the Qt libraries, and so on and so on. So it's written all must here, um, because buildroot runs as a non-privileged user. So all of those the files and output targets are owned by the user on your local machine that runs the build, and we can't uh, define correct permissions and ownership because everything is running as non-root. So there is between what is contained in output target and what's inside the final file system image, a little bit of magic going on, um, that uh, ensures that the permissions and the ownership in the final file system image uh, that you will flash on your SD card or that you will flash directly on your device are correct. Uh, so that's why it said almost. So if you, for example, NFS mount um, output target, that will not work in all situations because the permission and ownership are not correct. So it's almost a root file system. Yes, please. Uh, microphone. Do you want me to move the microphone around or? Are you using something like fake root to do that? Yes. Oh, that was a short answer. <laughs> uh, um, all right. So how is what what's happening when you run make? So I could go more in the details, but that wouldn't fit in the, in the time slot that we have. Uh, but the very high level overview of what's going on is, is in fact pretty easy. Uh, build root starts by checking what we call the core dependencies. Like, do you have a GCC available on your host machine? Do you have Python? Do you have all those uh, basic programs and that build root needs to operate. Then, for every selected package, um, it's going to go through a basic set of download, extract, configure, well, patch, configure, build, and install steps. And it does that while taking into account dependencies. So, let's say you want to build BuzzyBox. BuzzyBox is going to depend on what we call the file system skeleton, the basic directory hierarchy, which is itself a package. And it's also going to depend on the cross-compilation toolchain. The cross-compilation toolchain is going to depend on GCC. GCC is going to depend on the C library. The C library is going to depend on binutils, and so on. And so, so we have a big uh, dependency tree, uh, which is completely resolved by make. Make is designed to resolve dependencies. So we rely on make here to uh, resolve this dependency tree, and basically um, execute every step uh, that is needed to build every package in the right order. And this is sufficient to build our entire system. 
uh, at the end of this second step, we've got output target filled in with everything that we have uh, selected to be built for the target. Our uh, output host has all the native programs, the sysroot has all the headers and libraries that we need. Uh, everything is pretty much ready. And this is then when we enter the finalization step. And here we, um, in the third step, we copy what we call the rootfs overlay. So the rootfs overlay, it's a very, um, a very basic principle. The idea is you want to customize your root file system by adding more config files or scripts or stuff that didn't really fit in any of the packages. So we want to do more customization. It's simply a folder that gets copied over the root file system. So you can add more files to the root file system. And that's done at the very end of the build. So you can overwrite any file, you can do whatever you want in that root file system overlay. So that's one way of customizing the output of build root beyond packages. And then you can, uh, build root will call post build script, so it's a set of scripts that you define. Uh, you can have one or several of these, it's just shell or python or Perl script, whatever your language, uh, language you like, that are called after all packages have been built, but before we generate the root file system image. And you can use them to further customize your root file system. So a rootfs overlay is just, we copy files. So that's good if you want to add more files or override existing files, but you can't modify existing files uh, by doing like sets or grep or whatever. You can't remove files, while postbuild script is just a shell script or Python script that runs, and where you can do whatever you want on the state of the file system. So you can customize and then tweak things as you need. Um, then we generate the root file system image. So that's where you, we use a fake root and the tool to uh, take a bunch of files and turn them into an ext4 file system image or squashfs image or whatever other file system image format you've selected. And finally, we call um, what we call postma scripts. So those are scripts that are executed at the very end of the build. So it's exactly like doing make and then run some other command, except that it's gonna be done like automatically as part of the build. So these do scripts can take the images that uh, BuildRoot has generated and do something with them. Maybe combine them into some specialized firmware formats that you have. Uh, maybe while you're developing, automatically reflash or reboot your target or whatever you want uh, that makes sense to you, all right? Um, so the um, existing packages and options that uh, we have in BuildRoot um, are already, I, I think, are pretty useful, but there are uh, uh, many reasons for which you may want to customize the root file system generated. And to achieve that, you've got a bunch of options. I've already described the first two. You can create custom post-build scripts, post image scripts, and add uh, root file system overlays um, to customize your uh, system. Or you might add your own packages. Um, and especially if you, are, uh, you have your own libraries, your own applications, um, it would be a little bit uh, sad to not leverage the package management system of BuildRoot here and, and build them. Uh, you could build them in, in a post-build script, but that, that isn't really like very pretty and doesn't really leverage the, the, the power of, of BuildRoot. So you can instead add your own packages. And so here I'm gonna uh, try to give a 101 on adding new packages in BuildRoot because it's actually fairly easy to do so. Um, there's really two steps, so that, that's really two slides for adding packages here. Uh, the first step is uh, defining the configuration options for your package, what will show up in menu config. And the second step is describing how to actually build that package, right? So if we start with the first step, uh, every package has its own folder, package slash, the name of the package, and then in there you're gonna put different files that describe that package. Um, maybe I should uh, clarify that when we say package in the build root world, we are not talking about a binary package like deb or rpm or something like that. It's a recipe that describes how to build some kind of upstream um, library or application, okay? So it has nothing to do with a binary package. It should more, me, more be thought like a source package, all right? So if recipe makes more sense to you than package, uh, that's fine, you can call that recipe as well. Um, so we create a first file called config.in and it uses the kconfig syntax of the kernel. So if you learn that, and then you do kernel programming, you already learn kconfig. If you've already done some kernel programming, you already know about kconfig most likely. So here this defines one option that says, okay, this is an option that allows me to enable libmicro-httpd, there's some help text, some dependencies, so you can 
We need threads. So there's plenty of different dependencies. I'm not going to get into the details here. Uh, but that's basically enough uh, to get um, a new option show up on miniconfig. We have a higher level uh, config.in that includes all the lower level ones so that they uh, are organized in, uh, in the miniconfig. And so we have plenty of other packages included here and here. This allows this new option to appear in miniconfig. Um, if you have a new option in miniconfig, that's fine, but you run make, nothing's going to happen. We need to describe what needs to be done at build time. And this is what the make file, so we have a make file named after the package, libmicro.mk. And the principle of um, those make files is that they define a bunch of variables that are prefixed with the name of the package. So libmicro.httpd underscore and then some metadata information. So we're going to define the version, the website where we can download it, the license, uh, the license files, uh, whether we want to install uh, it to the sysroot, and in that case it's a library, so we want it to be installed in the compiler sysroot so that other applications, other packages can use it. Um, some additional config options that we want to pass. And here we are um, uh, packaging a package that uses the traditional auto tools. So you normally build it by doing dot slash configure, make, make install. Um, and because that uh, build system is uh, very standardized, instead of duplicating the logic to call configure with all the right options, all the right environment variables, and then be call make with the right option, the right environment variables in every auto tools based package. We have this um, uh, mechanism that we call in build with the package infrastructure that factorizes that logic. So the simple fact of doing eval auto tools package is going to expand in a bunch of make file logic that will take care of downloading the tarball from that site, extracting it, patching it, configuring it with the normal auto tools rules, uh, run, um, doing the build and doing the installation. For the configuration, this will affect the configuration. So the infrastructure knows that conf opt defines a number of dot slash configure options that need to be passed at configure time. This tells the infrastructure that at installation time, we want to install the package not only in the target, but also in the compiler system. All right? So obviously, there's a bunch more um, package infrastructures. There's many more variables. Uh, we've got plenty of documentation that explains that in details. But that is, those like uh, six, eight lines are sufficient to uh, add a new package in build root. Um, next to the config.in and the .mk, you can add a hash file that will allow build root to verify uh, that the tarball you're uh, using is really the one you expect, that it hasn't been modified or tampered with in some way. Um, and uh, so this um, <coughs> build logic, as I was saying, is based on um, what we call the package infrastructure that factorize how to build packages that use commonly uh, used build systems. So we've got one for auto tools based packages that are obviously very popular. Uh, CMake is also very popular, so we have a package infrastructure for them. Uh, we've got a large number of Python modules packaged in build roots, and all of them are built in the same way. So here again, we don't want to rip duplicate that logic over and over again in hundreds of different packages, and we've got some kind of uh, factorized make code that um, uh, includes that uh, logic and is used by many other packages. And we've got the uh, generic package infrastructure, which is the one you want to use if your package doesn't fit in any of the existing build systems. So it's using like a custom make file or a weird shell script to do its build, something non-standard, then you can use the generic package infrastructure where you will have to do more work than, than this because you'll have to describe by yourself, okay, to configure my package, you will have to do this, 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 and that. To build my package, you will have to do this, 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 and that. So it's more effort on your side. But I mean, if your package is not using some kind of uh, standard HB system, obviously you've got more work down the road. Uh, we've got many more package infrastructure for uh, specific languages, Lua, Erlang, Perl, and, and whatnot. And this is also all documented, but they all follow the same basic design principle. Um, so that's about it for uh, building new packages. And uh, my, my lab after that have, have uh, some ex um, explanation about it. Uh, I wanted to know to uh, mention the um, existence of devconfig. So it's going to um, kind of uh, loop back with the question on BSPs. Uh, in, in kind of some ways. Um, 
So very much like the Linux kernel has uh, dev config files that say, okay, if you want to build a kernel for uh, the pocket Beagle, so here is the dev config that you can use. It gives you a configuration that may not be perfect for your use case, but it's a good starting point. It's, it's known to work for that platform, and, and you can start with that. Maybe you will have to customize it down the road, but it's a good starting point, All right, okay? So the Linux kernel has that, and Beardroot has exactly the same principle. We have in the Buildroot tree a number of default configuration for a wide range of popular platforms, um, which give you a, uh, an easy to use and known to work starting point. So if you're using a Raspberry Pi or um, a, a Beagle board or some kind of Beagle bone or other variants, or you want to use QMU or any of those like popular platforms, we already have a dev config that basically will automatically set for you the appropriate configuration. It will define the architecture, the kernel version, the kernel configuration, the bootloader configuration, the bootloader version, and so on and so forth, that have been tested by some other contributor to the project, and that gives you an initial starting point. Those dev configs, they have in principle that they are minimal. They build a system that has just a bootloader, a kernel, and a simple user space with BuzzyBox. So it's a very small file system, uh, basic kernel, basic bootloader, is just to get you started all the way up to a shell and user space. And then it's up to you to add more packages depending on your need, all right? Because we can't decide, we can't know if you are uh, using your Beagle Bone to do a, a graphics multimedia system or a network uh, device or any other thing like that. So we just provide minimal um, basic starting points. But those are pretty um, uh, useful to get started if you use one of those uh, popular um, platforms. And you can obviously add your own dev configs. And that's the typical way that people using Buildroot uh, work in, in a team, is that when you have defined a configuration that works for your product, you add a dev config for it, your colleagues can use it to start the build and get the same configuration as you have, and then we may, they make useful changes to the configuration, they can adjust the dev config accordingly, commit that, and, and use it with others. Um, so to kind of uh, uh, wrap up, I wanted to highlight a few uh, design principles of uh, uh, Buildroot here. Uh, the first one I already mentioned, we are a cross-compilation only system, so we don't support building on the target. Um, we think cross-compilation is the right way to do embedded development. You can do cross-build, cross-debug, and that's very efficient. It requires a little bit of effort in the beginning, but it really pays off on the long run. Uh, we don't have any um, um, package management system. Um, as I already mentioned, so we're really a firmware generator, nor a, not a distribution generator, which may be appropriate for some project and may not be appropriate for some others. And the other thing is that Buildroot doesn't try to be smart. Um, and this is probably the part that uh, most people uh, get confused about uh, when they get started, is that um, if you have the following scenario, you do a configuration, you go in menu config, you do enable that, uh, select this, enable that, and so on and so forth, so you run your build. Everything is fine, everything is good, but you realize, ah, there is something in my configuration I would like to adjust. So you go and make menu config, you adjust your configuration as you need, and then you run make again. And here, Buildroot doesn't guarantee you that the result will be what you expect. Basically, we don't support uh, partial rebuilds. Buildroot is not smart enough to realize, oh, you have disabled this uh, package that previously was enabled, so I need to remove it from the root file system, rebuild all the reverse dependencies, redo this, redo that. So it, doesn't, it isn't smart enough to do that. It's actually a pretty um, complex uh, thing to do if you want to do it 100% correctly. And because we don't want to do something that's just 90% correct, we prefer to not do it at all. And therefore, if you want to have uh, the guarantee that your build is correct, the only solution is to do a full build from scratch. That's the only situation where Buildroot guarantees that the outcome is what matches your configuration. So in practice, when you are going to do a new release uh, for your embedded product, you are always going to do a new build from scratch. On your day-to-day -day basis, on your day-to-day -day work, uh, when you are going to get started with Buildroot, you will probably do a number of builds from scratch at the beginning because you won't really understand all the implications of the config changes you will make. But as your experience with Buildroot grows, you will more and more understand, okay, I just enable that thing. Enabling that thing has that sort of implication on the system. So the only thing I need to do now is just rebuild that specific package or this other specific package to get me going on my development without having to rebuild everything. 
But for sure, at the beginning, uh, you'll probably uh, be doing like make clean to clean up everything, restart the build to make sure that it's not something that you change in the configuration that is causing some kind of uh, build failure or weird behavior that you were not expecting, right? So the tool doesn't try to be smart. It relies on the user to be smart. Um, so if you want to have more um, documentation and support around build routes, we've got a fairly extensive manual. It's not great for all aspects of build routes, but it's really great for uh, creating new packages. So all the package infrastructure have extensive documentation describing each and every variable. Uh, so it's very highly detailed. Um, we have a training course on build routes that spans three days. And as I said previously, it's uh, all freely available. So it's not like uh, just buy the training. It's uh, go look at the slides and lab instructions and do it yourself if you want so. Uh, we've got the mailing list. And lots of people ask on the mailing list questions on how to package this or that. Uh, and then we are happy to uh, answer um, people asking. And we've also got, oh, the sharp is missing here. Uh, but it's obviously um, a sharp build route on, on Freenode, where uh, we hang out uh, on IRC. There's uh, about 150, 160 people at any time. Um, I should perhaps mention that build route is, for I don't know, some kind of historical reason, more European-based. So most of the activity happens at European working hours. Uh, so here in the US, there might be some kind of delay. Um, so please ask your question and wait a few hours before like giving up. Um, but that, I guess that's a fairly uh, traditional IRC uh, uh, recommendation anyway. So uh, before we get to that, uh, questions? Yeah, please, Mohan. Well, okay. Sorry? How, how difficult it is to put another uh, package, uh, a definition for my own hardware? Like since it's not Raspberry or anything like, how does how does one take from a say it, my vendor provided me with a Yocto based build? Um, so adding a package or adding support for a new board, which support is support for a new board. Basically. Support for a new board. Um, I would say it depends on on um, how good or bad the the support for the board is in general. I mean, it, unrelated to build root. If it has support in upstream um, U-boot, support in upstream Linux, uh, doesn't require crazy ways of building the firmware image, doesn't require crazy user space libraries. It's easy. It's five minutes to do. If on the other end. Um, your platform as um, um, a kernel that is not upstream, that is really weird, uh, that requires tons of patches, or um, a process to build the bootloader image that requires uh, to be signed, or things like that that's more involved, and then it requires more work. And then if your uh, platform uses, I don't know, um, a GPU that has uh, usually uh, um, funky user space closed blobs uh, that you have to package that are usually very commonly uh, don't use any standard build system. Um, that requires time to create the appropriate packages. So it really depends from, it really goes from like really easy and trivial from potentially not that easy if you um, have like non-standard kernel support, lots of user space uh, components that you need to package. So it's, the answer is really it depends. But usually it's reasonable to do. Yes, please. So starting a new project, new board either not supported in either Yocto or, or BuildRoot or is it supported in both? How do I decide? Uh, you mentioned BuildRoot doesn't have packaging types. So is it really, if I just need a static image and I don't need to do anything with it, then BuildRoot's right. Or if I need to be able to update it with individual items, then I should choose Yocto. Or is there some other set of criteria to think about? Wow. That's a very wide question. So, well, uh, build root or Yocto. So we, I, I gave a talk. Uh, when, when was that? Like three years ago or so, with my colleague. Is that Alain? the is that the uh, build root versus Yocto uh, yeah. throwdown? Exactly. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, so you could go in and watch that talk. I don't think that, that the arguments have really changed that much. So there's the the, the one you already captured, firmware versus distribution, which is uh, well known. I think there's the learning curve. That's a quite important one. I mean, that build root is definitely like easier to get started with. Uh, but at some point, it's going to become more limited than, than, than Yocto is. With Yocto, you can more easily express uh, situations where you have multiple boards 
for which you build the same systems, and you can describe, okay, each board has some variations in the kernel configuration, but the rest of the system is the same. Um, it will only build um, uh, the user space parts uh, um, a single time for bus or three platforms, and only build the kernel for each of those. So for building multiple um, systems targeting different hardware platforms or multiple variants of the same system, uh, definitely uh, Yocto will have more uh, flexibility in, in, um, in, in, uh, than, than BuildRoot has. In BuildRoot, it's really one config, generate one system through one build. So if you want to build three systems, you've got three configs, three full builds for the three systems. So it's kind of plain, simple, um, easy, but uh, the fact that it's plain, simple, easy also means that it has some inefficiencies at some point, right? Yeah, one of the most interesting things about the talk that he's referencing is that uh, there was a bunch of, of, of people in the, the audience that were similarly discussing these things at the same time. It, it's, uh, it's a very hard question to answer. Yeah. So I, I <laughs> so think a kind of a, a good rule of thumb is if you're, do, if you're targeting a single platform, and the system you're building is reasonably small, like you're not doing like a, a graphical thing that needs a web browser and GStreamer and, and whatnot. If you're building something relatively small, you need a bunch of user space packages, not too much. Um, it's something that's gonna take maybe 15 minutes to build in build root. Even if you have three platforms, okay, it's gonna be fine. The three times 15 minutes, no big, no big deal. Um, I think build root is a good, good fit. Or if you're targeting something like ARM no MMU or a really small, tiny platform where the system remains simple, BitRoot is a really good fit. If you start to have something that's really uh, more complex, uh, lots of graphics, lots of multimedia, targeting multiple platforms on different architectures, then it might it might definitely make sense to look into Yocto. And, and, and um, I would say generally speaking, BuildRoot does small better than, uh, yep. than Yocto does at the moment. Yep. Um, so, um, any other question while we're in the Q&A? So I'm not sure how we're running on time. Badly, yeah, but okay. Oh, we've got still one hour, and it's not too bad. Yeah, that's great uh, for okay. labs. So, um, I've prepared for you a um, kind of um, a set of like more practical labs uh, for the next hour. So the idea is to uh, leverage the, uh, the Pocket Beagle platform that hopefully all of you have uh, already have and have already used in some of the, the previous days. Uh, and I have prepared a lab in three steps. So the first step will be just building a minimal system for the Pocket Beagle. Um, we'll uh, create our build root configuration from scratch. Um, I know um, uh, Michael uh, Welling, I am incorrect correctly, um, actually did a dev config for the Pocket Beagle. So you could just use it and, and get going immediately, but I intentionally did not use his work so that you just start with the raw build root as it is from upstream and realize what it is to just add the support for a new board, right? So that kind of will answer some of the questions here. You will see that for the Pocket Beagle, it's fairly easy because it requires very few patches on top of mainline new boot and kernel. Uh, it may be different for other platforms, but that will show you how that, will, how that goes. So we'll use that to build uh, U-Boot, Linux kernel, and a minimal root file system with BuzzyBox. And then we realize, oh, okay, we have this bootloader, we have this root file system, but I need a SD card image. So we have a second step inside this, this first step where we'll uh, use a tool called GenImage that allows you to combine uh, um, several uh, file system images into a complete SD card image that is ready to DD on your SD card. So at the end of this step, you're gonna be doing DD uh, this file on my SD card, put the SD card back into the pocket Beagle, boot it, and you have a fully functional uh, minimal Linux system, okay? So that's gonna be our first step. The second step uh, will enable um, network over USB. Um, so the uh, pocket Beagle has a um, USB um, gadget controller, or USB device controller. Uh, and we'll use that to enable network connectivity with your uh, uh, machine. I'm not sure how that's gonna play with those of you using um, uh, virtual machines under Windows. I know nothing about Windows and VMs, so I'm not sure it's gonna work, but it worked for me. Um, and we'll use that uh, network connection to uh, allow us to connect over SSH to the board. Um, it's the reason why I've chosen those um, um, uh, steps is because to do 
uh, network over USB, we'll need an additional init script. So we'll use a root file system overlay to contribute more uh, files into our root file system. And SSH is going to be another package. So we'll go and uh, enable another package to our build. And again, we'll reflash and see on the targets that uh, those features are hopefully working. And then in the third step, we're going to build our own application, which depends on a library. So your Pocket Beagle has a bunch of GPIOs. We'll be using the libgpiod uh, library uh, and create a small application that links against it. We'll create a package for this application. And so you can see what it means to create a new package and build roots to edit to mini config, build it, um, get it uh, to link against uh, other libraries and things like that. So it's going to be fairly basic, uh, but show you the, the basic uh, steps on, on adding support for a new board, adding a new package, customizing a little bit the root file system. Um, so for all that stuff, I have put up some instruction that you can find here, or I guess they should be on the USB stick that um, has been passed around. Um, so you can normally follow these instructions. It hopefully should be fairly straightforward, but I'll be around to help you and answer your questions and guide you. And I guess Behan will be around and, and um, maybe other folks who already know a bit about build root around can help. Um, so I'll, I'll let you go through the instructions. Um, Hopefully they are clear enough. If not, yeah, I'll be around to, um, uh, to answer questions. Yes, please. Hi, so there are these thousands of useful packages. And in this case, you mentioned drop bear, which yes. is the first I've heard of it. I looked it up. It's, it, it looks like something I would like to be aware of if I'm creating my embedded system. Is there some kind of a catalog where I can uh, ha have some organized list of the types of packages that are available, why I would choose one versus another? Um, to help me get started. Uh, so you, I think we used to have in the build root documentation the long list of all the packages that we had, but that was horrible. It was like, like two thirds of the manual was this like long list of packages. So right now our catalog of, of packages make mini config. That's where you have our catalog of packages, right? And it's it's nicely organized. I mean, if you, if you, yeah, if you, outside of maybe outside of build root. Uh, just somewhere as a novice embedded Linux developer, how do I become aware of what the packages even are in, in order to go, go through and select what I might want on my system? I think there's really no, um, I, I think I understand your question, but I think there's no silver bullet for that. It's just a matter of experience, right? Yeah. Knowing that uh, if you want an SSH server, you've got the choice between drop bear and open SSH. It's just a matter of experience. Why would you choose uh, one or the other? It's also a matter of experience. And there's no so yeah there, there, there's no definitive yeah. list. It's yeah, like pr uh, pretty much coming to talks and yeah. reading blog posts and such as or or actually looking through menu config and build, build yeah. is a really good place to do yeah. it. Because then it's like oh there is this library name like lib blah blah. It's like oh I didn't know about this library. What is it doing? And maybe it's going to be totally useless for no for you today, but in a couple of years it's going to be oh I do remember I thought about this library which is doing I don't know can stuff or uh, I don't know display or whatever. So yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that. It's really a matter of experience, going to talks, uh, being curious about uh, new libraries um, showing up. It, yeah. Available Debian packages isn't a terrible place either to find out about things like this, but, but uh, for embedded, BuildRoot is the best yeah. solution yeah. Yeah, for, for a list. There's just a question over here. If you want to. Actually, a follow-up to the last question. So um, I recommend, I, I definitely recommend going through the, you know, through the Debian package manager, seeing what's available. There's, you know, see what's installed on your laptop. A lot of that stuff will work for embedded stuff too. It, it is going to be kind of a matter of experience. Another thing that you can do if you really want to see the uh, components of a Linux system and do it all by hand, I only recommend you do this once, is the... Uh, LFS. Yeah, L <laughs> Linux, from Linux from scratch. I, I I found that very useful well, to um, you, know, you hand compile everything and and last time I tried it a few years ago and it, it actually worked pretty well I didn't run into too many errors but that'll give you a pretty good idea of what makes up a typical Linux distribution yeah. and finally just try it, install several different Linux distributions you know, install you know, install one Debian based one you know one RPM based one like Fedora. Uh, and then you know, maybe OpenSUSE and just kind of look at all the packages that are installed in their respective package managers and try to understand what they do. And you'll see the you'll see what's in common. You'll see what's what's different, and that'll 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 really help you. Yep. 
So I generally entirely agree with what you say. I'm just going to say a small additional note is that uh, going through what you mentioned will generally guide you towards like the, the big full-featured implementation of things. Like you're unlikely to encounter, let's say, BuzzyBox on a full-featured distro. You're unlikely to encounter DropBear or use like kind of more lightweight uh, libraries or alternative. Or you, or you surely have systemd everywhere where you don't really add, you don't always have to use systemd or your embedded system. So it's going to give you a view that is biased towards desktop server installations while embedded might have some like um, light, lighter alternatives for some of the, the components of the system. But that's the, the lighter ones are still in Debian. Hmm? The lighter ones are still in Debian. So yeah, but it's... Yeah, it, it's no, not, no, they're not yeah, the right it's default. It's unlikely that, yeah, you, if you look at uh, Debian Fedora, you will like more look at a full-featured system that is like systemd and dbus sure. and all that stuff, sure. which may be needed in some embedded system, but it's not always needed, so that might give you a slightly uh, uh, different perspective. Agreed. But, Agreed. Absolutely. Agreed. Absolutely right. This was my experience, how I've taught myself Linux over the years, so that, but, that worked for me. Yeah, yeah, sure. And <laughs> I, also went, I also went uh, down that route, but I, I think yeah, it makes sense to point out that an embedded system might use some like lighter, more specialized uh, components that, that you don't necessarily encounter on a typical uh, desktop server system. That's it. Uh, all right, so um, um, I think I let you going on the, the different uh, steps here, and um, so on the USB sticks, in addition to the lab instructions, you also have uh, a tarball that contains the Buildwood Git repository and all the tarballs of the source code that we need to download just in case the network is too slow. Uh, so you can um, speed things up a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that uh, should be enough for you. So I'll just go around uh, and see if you have any questions and practical issues. So we're giving away a Yocto book by Rudy Strife. And uh, in the, uh, although we're about to do this anyways because it's ELC, what we're actually going to do is we are going to do the rock, paper, scissors game. And so I need you guys to go into the corners to watch to make sure everyone's paying attention because you're not eligible. <laughs> That's it. So can I get two of you guys to stay at the, stay at the back? Mike, Michael, can you come to the front? and? Uh, so we're going to be watching. So the, the, the trick is basically this. That's right, no cheating. So everyone's going to stand up, and we're going to play rock, paper, scissors. All right? And I guess, Thomas, if I can get you to come in over here. <laughs> and again, we're watching to make sure everybody plays fair. You don't want to play? <laughs> OK, it's very simple. Everybody is going to, that's right, you don't have to, you don't want to. Everyone's going to basically throw their, their hand sign up above, only one hand. Okay, so but the, the only rule is, is this, okay, I get final say, it's not going to be fair, and you're always wrong, okay? So, if it's time for you to sit down, it's time for you to sit down. Uh, if you tie, you lose. You have to definitively win. Uh, and if this goes right, well, we left with one person, and they, they get the book. If uh, this goes wrong, everyone sits down, and we have to start over again. <laughs> All right, so invariably it goes wrong first, so let's see how this goes. Anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one, two, three, and then throw, okay? And so everybody, and then we'll tell you who has to, who can stand up, everybody else sits down. Ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, so paper stands up, everybody else gets to sit down. All right, it's very, very fast. All right, so we have four people left. This, this is, uh, yeah, see, this this happens. Last time we did this, we lost everybody in the second the second go. So let's try this again. Ready? One, two, three, go. Ooh. Yeah, two rocks. All right. So this is this is going to be sudden death now. Ready? One, two, three, go. Oh. <laughs> It is. Okay, everyone stand up again. We'll try again. That's history repeating itself. All right. Let's try it again. One, two, three, go. <laughs> paper sit down. Uh, sorry, paper stay up. Everyone else sit down. <laughs> no. Pa pa paper st stay standing. Paper stay standing. Yeah. Okay. Wow, this is very, very fast. Okay. Let's try one more time. One, two, three, go. I have a feeling we've got a winner. <laughs> Rock wins. <laughs> there you go. 
Wow. Okay. So three rounds and we lost everybody. Uh, two rounds and we got a winner. So it was opposite of what we did in scale. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to finish up the? Okay. Does 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 anybody need any more uh, any any more help? We're just waiting for the next speaker. Yeah. Just, uh, anybody need more help? Um, uh, we we uh, we just need to get Tim up here, and we're we're finished. Otherwise, if you have any more questions for uh, for Thomas, uh, that works uh, that works well. But otherwise, I'd like to, th to thank uh, Thomas Pedazzoni from Bootlin for his great talk on boot on um, build root rather, and uh, thank you very much for uh, being in our our uh, what is this now eighth or eighth class uh, here at ELC. So um, one more talk, and that's on uh, advanced Yocto. Maybe we'll take a five minute break since everyone's waiting for a compile every anyway. Um, there should be uh, coffee or whatever else out there. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, and don't forget, there is a survey on the website. Please answer it. I know only one of you has so far, so it'd be really great if we could get some more people. And um, yeah, and, and definitely sign up for the mailing list as well.